everyone. It's so nice to see you in this space. I'm Catherine Hughes, and I'm an assistant professor in the communication design department here at MassArt. And I wanna welcome you to the first lecture of the spring 2021 series. Yay. Um, so as many of you know, the communication design department's lecture series features professionals in the field that represent the diversity of the medium and its practitioners. And we aim to host speakers who align with the public and inclusive mission of the college. So in that spirit, the lectures are always free and open to the public. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I have a few little housekeeping items. I'll ask that you please check to be sure that you're muted now and stay muted during the talk. But if you are willing to turn on your camera, please, please do so. We really appreciate it. It's so nice to see your faces. And it also really helps to quell that sort of nagging fear that the internet went out and I'm frozen, frozen looking like I've been sneezing for the last 10 minutes, which I think is something that we can all understand at this point in our Zoom careers. Um, so we've actually planned a pretty significant question and answer period for the second half of the talk today. And I'll keep an eye on the chat in the meantime. So if you have questions that come up while Jennifer is presenting, please feel free to put them in there and I'll be sure to get to them. Uh, finally, the talk is being recorded um, and I will post the link to the communication department Slack later today so that you can reference it if you so choose. So with that, I am very excited to introduce today's speaker, the extraordinary Jennifer Morla. Jennifer is the president and creative director of San Francisco's Morla Design, where she has worked with an impressive roster of clients, including Apple, Levi Strauss, Stanford University, Design Within Reach, and the New York Times Magazines, as well as a number of arts and nonprofit organizations. In addition to being a recipient of our profession's top honors, the National Design Award and the AIGA Medal, Jennifer's work is included in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. She's also featured in Meg's History of Graphic Design, which is a pretty stunning accomplishment. Her glorious monograph, Morla Design, was published by the Letterform Archive in 2019, and she is also a MassArt alum. So please help me welcome Jennifer back to her alma mater. I am only sorry that it couldn't be in person. Um, and if you guys don't mind, really quickly, if we can just unmute and do a round of applause, it's a nice way to know that there are people out there. Got it? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. That was just really, you know, lovely. I love um, that I'm able to do this and I've been invited to be back at Mass Art again. I loved going to school there. It was very instrumental in how I think about design, both from a practicality standpoint and a conceptual standpoint. I think they did a very good job, the teachers and the school, in integrating those two. And hopefully that's what this lecture is going to show. This is pretty short. I'm going to try and keep this to a half hour. Catherine, you, you like say something to me if I'm going a little long on this because I want enough time for our, our questions and answers and get everybody's um, feedback. So um, I'm going to just sort of start in here. And so um, I'm going to be talking about the complexity of simple things, making design memorable. And that's what we all hope for that our design efforts are consequential and meaningful. So at the start of every project, I challenge myself to, how can I design smarter, more truthfully, and less wastefully? How can I create a compelling visual narrative? And how can I touch people's lives in a way that resonates meaningfully? So every project I take on must reference and respond to these questions. I do that as a, as a test for myself. So here are a few of my projects, which I prefaced with what I call my designisms, which is um, simply my observations and uh, learnings throughout my design career. Design does not live in an aesthetic vacuum. Design is influenced by and influences contemporary society. So this piece um, was for the Mexican Museum and they um, hired me to uh, reach out to a more youthful constituency, the Latinx community. And one of the first things I did is really obviously understand what their collection was. And they had this wonderful image of Frida Kahlo um, from the, um, the Kodak Foundation. And um, it's a poster. And what I wanted to do was, first of all, I translated it into Spanish, <laughs> which was, sort of shocking that they hadn't done that before. So El Museo Mexicano. And then what I did was um, created this Bende portrait of Frida Kahlo and integrated um, uh, popular Mexican motifs, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Lotteria image of the, of the palm tree and used um, turn of the century wood, wood type um, combined with cutout type 
for the um, for the uh, 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 headline on the poster itself. So it was very successful. It really reached out to an audience that um, really only considered the museum pre-colonial art and put it into a new a new um, uh, way of understanding what the museum was all about. I'm a big believer in posters in that posters oftentimes outlive a movement or an institution because they're hung in people's homes. So, you know, even though it feels like nearly an antiquated medium, everything being digital, a poster actually has a very um, long lasting um, effect um, and, and, and is considered art. So keep that in mind. Once One of the things I think that we're gonna be talking about uh, with Catherine is really how to, what is the right medium for the message? And um, in this case, the poster was that. This is for public bikes. Um, I, the research I did for public was that the majority of the people that bought the, their bicycles were women. And um, they are a street bike, uh, so you sit upright. And so I imagined a person, a woman, bicycle riding to the farmer's market and picking up, you know, the flowers. And once again, this is, you know, so you can see the flowers. And then the bottom, I have a little gear with a little asterisk representing a flower in the basket. So um, this was printed really large. It's um, uh, three feet by four feet. So it's a really big poster that went around the city. And it was, it was very, um, it's, it's beautiful. You know, flowers are just one of those beautiful things. When there's an opportunity that feels appropriate to use them, I use them. And this was for the um, elections in Iran, the rigged elections in Iran. And it gave me, it was freedom of speech poster. Um, I took a photograph of my lips and then um, uh, conceptually uh, stitched them together with these red lines and the, uh, the color of the movement, the green movements, so therefore uh, Iran in green. I think metaphorically also this uh, uh, talked not only to the rigged elections, freedom of speech, but also to the silencing of women. And then San Francisco was um, one of the big cities for the 2012 Olympics. And when I was asked to do a poster to um, attract um, the uh, Olympic Committee to uh, consider uh, San Francisco as its venue, I wanted to really create an iconic portrait of an athlete. And um, with that, I chose, um, I chose the model, uh, got the photographer, and then sort of in the spirit of San Francisco, 60s posters had these rays of color coming out of, out of her head. Um, certainly sort of a future vision, very with a little bit of a Swiss knot here, um, but uh, the vision of what I considered um, our athletes. So words are as important as images and images can be more powerful than words. A great person who exemplified this notion was Tibor Kalman. If you don't know who he is, you should look him up. But he did a magazine called Colors. And it was, um, he really used um, this uh, images and words beautifully together. This was for Design Within Reach and it's a catalog. And Design Within Reach is a furniture company. So you're thinking, why is there grass on the cover of a furniture company catalog? Well, first, the very first thing design should do is it should surprise. You know, gosh, you know, what is this? Because maybe I'm not interested in furniture. So if I put furniture on the cover there, the first thing people would say like, I'm not interested, I'm not buying furniture, throw the catalog away. So that's not what I want to do. And I want to actually create a dialogue with the audience about what is green, because that was, you know, a very prevalent issue in um, in in the um, the furniture industry. So I put a piece of sod grass on the front cover and a piece of astroturf on the back, in order to have that conversation about what is really green. So greenness upcycling pans into a chair that lasts 150 years. And this is also a juxtaposition, I'll be talking about this later, of combining the brash with the sublime. Here's this, you know, sort of full bleed color photo of these smash cans and then this Philippe Stark, beautiful, um, the sublime uh, chair sort of in black and white. And that's what makes this, this spread work. Green is alternative uses for 300 million tires discarded annually. So as designers, we think like architects, we actually structure space to engage and facilitate understanding. This was for um, a Stanford lecture series uh, um, and uh, for postgraduate, postgraduate um, uh, uh, novel 
postgraduate series on the novel. They would have um, five lectures a year and they would find that the first couple of lectures were well attended, but then people tended to forget when the next lectures were. So what I did was created this series of posters. The first one introduced the series like this. And then here it was for the second, for the first, excuse me, for the first, um, for the first talk, the second talk, third talk, fourth talk, and fifth talk. So what this did by virtue of just switching the spine to the folios, let people know that there's why oh, there's two more lectures to come. So here's a you know a different way of thinking about um, letting them know what's coming up versus just a hierarchy of information. Next, 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 which is top to bottom. Let's think about a different way of expressing that um, sequence. Uh, for the New York Times, um, this was the first issue on um, what basically what is design. And when the New York Times calls you, it's, you know, so great, wonderful. And they say, oh, we want you to do the cover of the magazine. Oh my God, that's so superb. And oh, I'm sorry, you only have two weeks, no problem. I'll just clear the schedule. There's not much money, like whatever it was, 1,500, 2,000, no problem. Oh, and by the way, we're going to ask six other designers to also create the cover. And I said, well, what happens to the losers? Oh, don't worry, we're going to print a whole loser section. So the motivation was high. Um, and since the title was the shock of the familiar, you know, how all objects are designed, everything we touch is designed, I actually want to make this, the magazine a designed object too, to make people understand that the magazine was an object that they were also, that was also designed. By turning that masthead upside down, you actually have more of a reference to what you are holding, and, and, and an awareness that this was um, that this was uh, the shock of the familiar. So a good designer is a great storyteller, and every company, institution, service has a story to tell. So use real words. Don't use that corporate, you know, speak, which I can't stand. Um, and you know, designers are writers. Learn 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 how to write or work with writers. It's it's such a key part to communication. So um, this was a poster I did for Levi's. What was um, really nice about the ask on this poster was that I knew I didn't have to show a pair of Levi's jeans because Levi's are ubiquitous. Everybody knows what a pair of Levi's jeans looks like. So um, in all my pieces, I, I do the casting, I hire the models, I hire the photographer, I do the hand lettering in this case. So it's a, I really only take on jobs I can do start to finish. Um, in this case, it's sort of where you have to allow the process to be part of the solution. And um, when, uh, the, when this wonderful uh, uh, young woman came to set, I started asking her like, you know, what makes you feel, had you have examples of being empowered? Because that's what we want to do with this poster. We show like the, you know, uh, young women who, who really believe in themselves. He said, well, uh, when I was little, I, I played king of the mountain and um, she would win every time with the boys. And so she called herself Queen of the mountain. And I just love that story. It really um, epitomized what the attitude of what Levi's was about. This one, this one we did, I think, in around uh, 1997. And then uh, another great ask from Levi's, they didn't ask me to do a book. They said, we need something that's going to go out to our wholesale force and our retailers. Um, and we need something that tells, you know, what can we do to talk about the history of our gene. And, you know, they thought, actually, I think they thought it was gonna be a poster. I said, no, let's do a book. And going through the Levi's archives was fantastic. So one of the first things I did, they thought I would cover the book in denim. I wouldn't wanna do that because that's, you're, that's recontextualizing something that's not real. Instead, what I did is I took their back pocket patch, the very famous, this is a pair of Levi's jeans, and blew it up and silkscreened it on chipboard. And then on the back cover, you can see that I actually put in a little Levi's red tab and I bound that into the back, back side. And this is another case where words are as important as images because this is just great copy, which I did not write but worked with a writer on. You wore them in the California gold mines during the boom years, during the depression, on assembly lines, in fields, in small town America, in vast urban sprawl, to school, to graduation, to protest, to vote, to Woodstock, to Woodstock too, on your first date when you broke up, to your wedding, to the office, to surf the internet, with the Chanel blazer, with a plain white t-shirt, in the White House to fit in, to stand up, to be yourself. And that is exactly what Levi's is. And then I had this vast, oh my God, this wonderful um, archive to go through. So I just threw a bunch of labels on the table, shot that. 
and then sort of this posterized image. And why I did this is that um, they had a wonderful archive of images all from, you know, 1850 when they were founded to, you know, to present day, but 80% of them were black and white. Now, if I did a whole book in sepia tone and black and white, that would be boring. So what, here was a way to make it feel more relevant, more current, and really bring some pop to the book. So each one of these spreads had sort of different posterized colors to them. This was this chocolate company for Thomas Keller, who's a, a Michelin star chef, and he went into chocolates with another partner, Armand Amani, and they called themselves K plus M chocolate. Um, what this is trying to do here is I want to really let the packaging talk to what was uh, what was inside, what type of chocolate was inside. So therefore you see dark chocolate um, in an all black package. You see the milk chocolate in an all white cho uh, package and then dark milk in a half black and half white package. This was really meant to stand apart from the um, proliferation of chocolate. I mean, there's some beautiful chocolate bars out there. As we go to the grocery store, you know, you see beautiful and you buy them for the packaging. But a lot of them are filled with lots of, you know, foil stamping and curly cues and wonderful dense, you know, lettering and all that sort of stuff. So this was really um, in opposition to that. So, you know, keep in mind what the context of um, who, you're, who you're up against and, and let your work stand out. Uh, when a Fortune 500 company comes to you at its very inception, this was uh, William Sonoma, and they were starting a new brand called, well, they didn't have a name for it. It was for monogramming. It was a monogram brand that would be mainly on handbags and um, sort of luxury accessory items. And the, um, the president came to me and said, Jennifer, I don't have a name, but I really want people to understand that when they're doing a monogram that they're making, uh, people wanna make a mark on their things. They wanna you create a mark and put it on their, on, on, on their handbag. And it's all about monogramming. I said, well, there's the name, Mark and Graham, making a mark or a monogram. And it also gave a personality to the brand. Um, so here's sort of the look, everything always against white. So design is all about art direction and photography and lettering. And it's everything, you know, and really attention to all those details is what makes everything come together as one big, beautiful brand. So um, I, after, the identity, after the name, the identity, the packaging, these catalogs, I did the website, I'm not even showing you that website, et cetera. And then of course the art direction of the photography, this is my dog, Zoe who I get to use for free, you know, on set. She's, you know, <laughs> I have her there with a little little uh, 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 dog treat in front of her so she looks straight at camera. And then the little things that I did. So first of all, I put like, okay, what do I want on this set? Very, very low budget for these sets. So it's just, you know, sort of a beadboard wall. And then I took the dog biscuit that the stylist brought. She brought some dog biscuits for her photographed them just right away, just did a little quick black and white, blew it up on the printer and framed it. And that's what made that set and made a little story happening here. So we're great storytellers, that's what we do. So the medium is the message and this is a nod to Marshall McLuhan, of course, um, but evaluate the stylistic structure and content of any given piece by investigating if the medium can be the message. In this case for Nordstrom's, it was for their credit cards. And they had to have a holograph so that each one would be sort of unique. And what I did first time in the industry is actually create the whole front of the card as a hologram. So here's the four different, um, the four different levels of their credit cards. And when you um, have them, they actually move as a hologram does. So these dots go in and out and the circles rotate. So um, what a wonderful thing to have in your wallet. And they increase their, um, their uh, sign up for credit cards by 70% after this card was, was launched. So it was a big success for them. Clorox, um, so Clorox calls me up and is like, oh my God, boring, boring, boring company who wants to work for Clorox. But, and especially a book which pays you basically nothing, There's, you're never gonna make money to design books. But that said, I said I would do it if they would let me actually take the material that was used on the iconic Clorox bottle and create a cover. So what I did is I worked with their engineers and we created the dye from the 1972 Clorox bottle, which is their iconic bottle, and then had this vacuum formed. And on the inside, so that's all there was. I didn't need to have color on the cover, nothing, because the bottle itself is what the brand is. It, you immediately know it's Clorox. On the inside, on the end papers there that you can see, um, are all the different um, companies that they own, SOS pads, et cetera. So I took their 
somewhat ugly logos and just blew them up really large. So you have this juxtaposition of this all white, very um, uh, bas relief cover with this bright brash interior. So design must surprise and inform. And so you want to surprise your audience with the unexpected and allow their curiosity to lead them to the message. Uh, this uh, was for a, a, another lecture series for Stanford. Uh, this is called Identification of Defense. So what I want to do with these posters is literally cover these beautiful sort of, um, uh, uh, this, in this case, 18th century portrait. Um, and it, 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 it beckons you to want to learn more. And it's, you know, identification of the fact that we're even covering her up, or in this case, uh, possibilities for the future of the planet, or on beauty, another opportunity to use flowers. So multiples work, lots about, of, of just about anything makes a memorable visual. So in this case, all the peppercorn flowers for uh, a restaurant called Palette, they, the peppercorns being one of the um, spices that they worked with. For Sculpture Center in Long Island City in New York, actually a series of three logos their building was done by Maya Lin. And um, uh, signage, this was used on signage on their website and, and in, in their print, print materials. But it allowed us to actually take, it allowed me to actually think about how many different ways can we think about sculpture because this was a new way of thinking about sculpture, not just as a, as a singular, plinth of a form, but more how sculpture as volume. So I looked for typefaces that actually, and, and, and ways to work with those typefaces that insinuate volume and experience. For, this was for CCAC. Um, this was another poster series for Fabrice Bear. Um, we did, these were installation pieces. We did not know what the installation would be about um, basically until it was installed. So all I did here was take the swatches uh, an F and an H and combine them to make sort of a series that was a whole black and white series of posters. So extremes work really large or really small or really uh, colorful, really simple or really dense, really. So uh, for, uh, this was just going to be a, a, a book, uh, not a book actually, just a, a paper, a white paper on research, a research paper but I turned it into a big, this is 18 inches tall, printed on paper that was laminated to chipboard. So it's really thick with a two inch wire row binding. Uh, a little something about typefaces here. Um, this is Bell Gothic. What makes Bell Gothic unique is that it has a serif eye. So if you're gonna use Bell Gothic, you should you make sure that what you're gonna be typesetting has an eye in it, or else it just looks like any other Gothic, like trade Gothic typeface. So be aware of what letters in a typeface make it unique to that, um, make it unique to that typeface. This is an annual port for um, San Francisco International Airport. This measured only four inches tall, so it could literally fit in the back pocket. The advantage of it being four inches tall were a couple of things. One, the beginning of the airport started in, uh, I think, 1990. Uh, people, so if there was any, uh, well, pre-digital, so we had a lot of pocket cameras that were taking pictures of job sites. It was for their new international terminal. Um, and then once it got digital, uh, you couldn't really blow it up. Therefore, the, um, the car rental uh, places that actually are pixelized, which I love the way that looked. So this little little annual report could actually go into all the employees' back pockets. It's easy to take out. It was just a really memorable piece. And it's a timeline. Also for Design Within Reach, this was for their outdoor catalog. This measured uh, six inches tall, little perfect bound book that got uh, an outdoor. It was for the uh, beginning of spring. They were opening up their a uh, new store in Hawaii. This is the Hawaii Cardinal. You've learned about that all on the inside, but another uh, different way of thinking about um, a catalog. And then my monograph. So what I learned from the Clorox book, the vacuum forming I used actually on, on, the, uh, on my monograph that just got published by Letterform Archive. A great resource for you guys, letterformarchive.org. You should absolutely go to it. They have um, probably the best collection of design ephemera and books anywhere in the world. And um, uh, it's very accessible, great for students. So letterformarchive.org, um, a great company. This is what you would see inside the book. So quick little um, ideas as to why, why I did what I did for each one of these pieces. Vellum that had my designisms on them. 
um, a little bit about my essays. I wrote 25 essays on influences and um, uh, really influences. And then this whole section as to what makes specific letters of specific typefaces unique. So for example, here, um, the meta G with its snaking, the snaking G, a very unique double story G. So accidents often produce the best solutions. Only you can recognize the difference between an accident and your original intent. So in this case, um, I had <clears throat> one of my um, interns scan an image. This, is, this was done in 91. And I thought the image would be continuous tone. It didn't, it turned out like this. When I saw it, I thought, how fantastic is that? And then the letters here, that was my hand lettering here, filled in back in the days you had to unfill the letters, but I liked where it was going. And actually I thought about the name for this design series, which was the radical response. So how perfect that all of these elements came together. And if I had just sort of taken, said like, okay, production person, just go ahead and do what, you know, what, what, what I thought was going to be the case, it, this solution would have never come out. For swatch, where I just scribbled some, some hand lettering and then it looked fantastic and I, it means nothing, it's gibberish. So design brings content and meaning into focus. Design is understanding made visible. So by crossing everything out on this poster, we really are able to read what is important. For uh, uh, arts catalog, the um, back part is uh, in vellum for their four different sections. So cyan, magenta, red, and black. Uh, indicating their four different types of performance art, um, visual art, uh, film art, and um, spoken word. And a recent project for Neolife, they, it's all about uh, genetics, genetics and bi, uh, uh, new, new forms of biology. So Zuzana Licko did this typeface for the O, um, and uh, it was the perfect way of, 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 of making, um, making that illusion to what the a very sort of scientific interior was. Great design is quite simply innovation reflecting the spirit of an era. It becomes a classic because of its timeless appeal. George Nelson, this is for Herman Miller. You know, of course, have the splints, Eam splints, and the whole idea of uh, molded plywood. This, so Herman Miller came to me and they said that they, um, that young designers weren't specking Herman Miller anymore. They were specking either knockoffs or Knoll or something like that. And they said, we need to do something. I said, you know, why don't you do a very easy to read book? Once again, I'm a big, books are often a great solution because they stay on the desk. They're going to take it and all of a sudden they realize very quickly, oh, this is what these people, I'm going to spec this furniture. So a wonderful way of talking about the classics. Of course, this, this um, chair is still um, available today. So try juxtaposing opposites, the historical with the vernacular, the rough with the refined, the brash with the sublime. For some hang tags or another jeans company, this means absolutely nothing, but it was a hang tag that I want people to save because jeans on a rack look like any other jean, but the hang tag sort of makes it unique. And so, um, you know, we just had fun with this, you know, juxtaposing opposites. For another, for a book uh, published by Dell for actually Frank Zappa's daughter, but the type, the incongruous type, it's Clarendon with the images. And don't be afraid to use humor. It's funny, it's memorable, and it makes your audience smile. <laughs> I'm going to ask that we all do the same thing and unmute and clap for Jennifer for that fantastic presentation. So, yay. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. And your timing was absolutely spot on. I think it was exactly 30 <laughs> minutes. So congratulations. I feel like you gave us so many 
interesting points of entry to talk about your work. And I know there are some things that we wanted to touch on, but I think for me, one of the things that really rises to the surface is your use of the physicality and the tactility, you know, whether it was the two inch spiral bind or the pocket size book. I'd love to hear more about that and how you use that as a mode of communication. Um, and especially now that so much is digital and we're interacting through screens, how does that affect the way you're thinking about the current moment in design? Um, well, the first thing is try never to do, try never to design what is expected. You know, so that was, I think, evidenced in some of my work, but in a way, and this is often a point that, that students come to me, they say, okay, I'm going to be doing a whatever, uh, even if it's a website. This is typically about what this website, I'm gonna do it like this because this is what these things look like. This is, I'm gonna do a book and it's gonna be, you know, um, nine by, you know, seven by nine. It's like, why do it like that? Make extremes. So even in, even in a digital environment, you can work with extremes in very interesting ways. Um, uh, basically you wanna stand apart from everybody else. You wanna be noticed, you want, especially in a digital, I have to say, um, there are aspects online that you want to make sure work well. I mean, number one, a website or anything you're doing digitally should be flawless in the way it works. So, you know, the coding has to be really perfect, work with great coders, etc. cetera. Um, I have to say there's a one, there, you know, with Squarespace, which we use sometimes basic square paste, uh, place templates and then sort of re-tweak the coding a bit and just make them great. Um, you know, sort of expand them, really make them look different, you know, so that that there's something, um, there's something innovative happening. I'm a judge of the Webby Awards, and it's been for over, for its inception, basically. And I have to say, it's really disappointing the last few years, because everybody's using, you know, the formats, and they just all look the same. So there's such an opportunity to break out and be different, whether that's just a word, one word starting on, on a splash screen or whatever that is, just think, just think differently. You know, think how, how extremes, whether that is just, you know, one, uh, one of something can be extreme or a thousand of something can be an extreme. So um, just sort of be different. Okay, that's a Steve Jobs thing, I know, but I, I, <laughs> think different. Think yeah. different. Totally. Yeah. No, I think that I think that's such good advice, especially when things are becoming more templated. And mm -hmm. there are so many expectations that are driven by user experience. Finding those moments where you can stretch and find new ways to express content is so critical. And also another thing, and this is with my current clients also, is that there's not ever just one touch point that is connected with a brand. In other words, there will it's never just a website. It just never is. Either you're gonna have you're either gonna have ads or you're gonna have some sort of print that or an environment or something that that this person is exposed to you know or this audience is exposed to so you have to think about those different touch points and how to integrate those um that are appropriate to the medium that they're in mm -hmm. absolutely i know you spoke a little bit about how you use this philosophy when you're interacting with students i'd love to hear more about that what else do you recommend for people who are just starting out in their careers um well, just, you know, really, as, as I think that the, um, think about every aspect to a job. And I have to keep on saying that's images and words. It's it, those two just live together. And um, I think that the most interesting pieces that I am attracted to, whether it's in, in just, this is influence in general, whether it's in theater or whether it's in, in, in fiction, I read a, a ton of fiction, um, is where that you are juxtaposing two things that don't feel like that they should be together. And that's what makes them not only both, both, both components richer, that understanding is richer. And once again, we're storytellers, that's what we're doing. So we're trying to tell the story and tell it in your own way, use your own voice to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, and I, oh, thank you, Catherine. Actually, now I'm remembering exactly what we talked to before is that when I start off on a project, the first thing you do is research. And this is, you know, over my course of teaching, you know, 23 years, you start off with research, but there's an end to research. You know, you have to, at some point, just say, okay, research is in service to the problem I am trying to solve. So just remember that. 
Yeah. After you do that research and you go ahead and analyze that research and then you start ideating. And I'm a big believer in sketching and sketching ideas. Every idea I have, I just sketch out. I mean, it could be stick figures. It doesn't make a difference. You know, I think drawing's a good thing to, to learn, but just ideas out there. Don't work ideas on the computer that you're bogged down with too many, uh, too much criteria that's not pertinent to the point of ideation. So just think of ideas. And so I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. I'm not even thinking about medium yet. I'm just thinking about ideas. Like what, what, what do I wanna communicate here? Then after you think of all these different ideas, then start thinking about a structure. Okay, how would this idea be in just black and white? How would this idea be just in color? How would this idea be um, uh, just with type? How would this idea be just with illustration? How would this idea, so then you go through that. Still, I'm not dealing with form yet. I'm not dealing with actual, like the, the um, I'm just dealing with methodology. So we go ideation, then we're going methodology, and then you're actually doing the creation of the form. Okay, now that I thought, okay, black and white seems appropriate for this because of this credit and da da da, and type and da da da. Now, what would be the best medium to express this in? Would that be a film? Would that be a, a website embedded in there? Would that be a book? Would that be an installation? Um, would that be an environment? Would that be just a language? Would that be a uniform? I mean, for example, you could say, you know what? I think your brand and a brand is not a logo. I'm gonna say that again, a brand is not a logo. A brand is a total experience. Uh, so for example, if I, um, a, a company came to me and I said, you know what? This is what your brand is gonna be. You're gonna paint everything right. Your website's gonna be all red. Your stores are gonna be all red. Uh, your, your employees are going to be dressed in all red. And there we go. No logo. That's a brand. So, you know, you just sort of think that way. It could be in the way you talk, you know, in the way, in the way you approach something in the way in, in, in uh, for example, early internet days, I was approached by, I think it was actually early PayPal people. I, I forget what it was, SoftBank or somebody like that. And um, they were, uh, creating a new way of, they're doing e-commerce. It was the first time e-commerce was gonna be online. And they want to uh, give a secure way that the audience would know, the user would know that their transaction was secure through Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. Um, I said, well, you know, you're gonna have the little Visa and MasterCard little icons up there, you know? So I don't suggest putting another logo there, like, you know, secured by whatever the name, you know, the name was. I said, I think instead that when you click on uh, on you know the the pay button, you get a three tone, you get a sound, do do do, you know, and then you know every time you hear that your transaction's secure, you know. So it's those sort of ways of thinking about what is an identity. Well, and I love I love that expansive approach to design too. I feel like so often we get mired in very pragmatic solutions, and the idea of thinking in sound, thinking in installation, thinking in books or movies is such a nice way to go beyond what's expected. Um, I think something that really resonated with me about what you just said is is the process and the methodology and moving through ideation. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get stuck? What are the ways that you get out of one of those uh, moments where nothing is coming to you? What are your processes like? Uh, well, a few things I procrastinate. Procrastination is a really good way because, you know, you just sort of, you know, pause. I have to, this is, this is, this is very personal, but I get all my ideas in the shower. Honestly, I, I, okay. I take a 10 minute shower. I am guilty because I'm just like, think it's just a great place for me to think of ideas. But let me just say, I expose myself to a lot. And I think that that's very difficult, of course, in these pandemic days, but there's a lot out there. And so I get so many ideas from theater, from dance, from, from, from travel, from all those things give me ideas from reading. Uh, Virginia Woolf, when she did um, Orlando, where all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, Elizabeth is from goes from a boy to the queen like within a chapter it's like wow when did that happen and so that's a juxtaposition that's what happens in fiction or when I saw Peter Brooks do the um, uh, Mahabharata this very beautiful uh, production that was so dense with all sorts of 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 of, of visual um, visual uh, uh, eye candy that you think like oh that's an extreme and matter of fact just one following that his performance after that for for um carmen was completely stripped of everything it was just it was just 
four people on a stage. It's those sort of juxtapositions. So theater, I mean, dance, the New York Times, the, the Gulf, read the newspaper. There's always something there. There's a review. There's something that makes you think like, oh, if I reference like what is happening in, in performance, what's happening, you know, sort of with ancient cultures, how did they, re how, did, how, how, did, how did the Mayans think about this? Or, you know, like there's so much to tap into. Um, history, everything. So I, I honestly, everything's inspiration. That's you just have to be curious. Be yeah. curious. Foster and facilitate curiosity. I love that. Yeah. That's some of the best advice you can give to anyone. I do want to encourage, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat and I am happy to read them out or I will invite you to unmute to ask the question yourself. Of course, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, while we're waiting for some of those to come in, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask about your studio practice. So how many designers do you have in the studio right now? Uh, me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have myself and actually one of my students uh, uh, that I hired that I hired straight from school. You know, he was an intern and then, then an employee. Um, he works on his own, but I use him. We, we work together a lot. And um, it's, it's really just, just us. So he's, you know, it's great. I think it's great when you have a, a instructor that you really love and they have their own practice, find out whether they, <laughs> they're, they're going to be hiring because it, you know, you, you, you sort of know each other already, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, I did, my office was up to 18 people. Um, I did massive projects, a lot of architecture uh, for, uh, for Levi's also. I didn't show any of the Levi's or the design within reach or any of those, but I did all their stores. Uh, Wells Fargo, I did everything for Wells Fargo from every credit card, every check, every ATM, every branch, uh, the, sort of you know, the whole totality, their logo. Um, so uh, you need a lot of people to do that. So I had, you know, I had an architect on staff. I had, um, you know, I, had, I needed, I needed that sort of, uh, um, it was, it was great. And the time sort of allowed for that. I think that at this point in my career, I'm just interested in doing, um, I was, was telling you earlier, what I do now is companies come to me and I do a whole new um, uh, look and feel for them. And so it's just give me, give me six weeks and I come back and it's a completely new sort of look for them. Uh, but that said, I'm very conscious of what should be kept, you know, just because somebody wants something new doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe their identity is fine. Maybe it's just the way they were using their identity. So, um, you, you know, just don't, don't be too seduced by, um, by, by, uh, you know, oh, they're coming to me and I'm doing, you know, I, I, I need to do all this. Be, 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 be smart about it. Um, and anyway, so that's where I'm with my practice right now. I absolutely adore it. I only take on basically one, one, one client at a time and they're big, big projects. So um, it, it makes me happy. And then I, I, well, I'm a mom. So our kids now, so my husband, we have two children. Uh, and that was really interesting too. I uh, had our two daughters when I was 39 and 40, which was the perfect time. Of course, you never, I didn't plan having our children then. It just so happened. And uh it, but it happened at a sort of a perfect time because it was 1995 and 96. So uh, early, early, early internet and being able to transfer files, <laughs> albeit on a Cyquist disc. But you, you know, I could work from home and still, you know, uh, my office was not that far away, and I had about eight people at the time, mm -hmm. so that worked out really well. I think it's, I think especially for the women out there in the audience, it's you know, it's a challenge to balance, you know, being a parent. You know, well, I, I should say for the men and women in the audience because that's what it should be. Um, but regardless, I think that you know, as as we we are pregnant, we are the ones who are carrying the children. It's it's important to make sure that you have a good um, a good foundation of what you want to do as a designer. You know, I think that that was very important to me. Having a family was very important, also. And it's you know, it's a balance between the two, but. Um, I've been very lucky and it's, it's worked out, you know, our kids are wonderful, 20, 24 and 25 right now. So uh, yeah. I have to ask, are either of them designers or are they in the fine art? Practice? They are not. My husband's, my husband's an architect and I'm a designer and neither one, although 
Uh, the oldest one works for Peacock TV, so she's a, a senior project manager. And uh, the other one works um, uh, actually uh, specifying um, fixtures and furniture for the, uh, for the uh, uh, hotel industry. So, you know, sort of, uh, they both have very strong points of view about design, let me just tell you, and architecture and all that. But they're not actually makers, neither one of them are. Interesting, but design thinkers, which is equally. But design thinkers and design appreciators and really sort of, I think, I hopefully learn from us just sort of a critical sort of eye and, be, and, and being an observer, like looking up and like, you know, just being an observer. That's another thing. Just mm -hmm. be aware of what you're looking at. Well, I have to say part of what inspired my original question about the size of your studio is I was curious how directly you interact with clients because I know a lot of times as individuals move in their careers, they, they tend to be more distanced from the work that they are participating in. And it sounds like you have a really direct relationship with your clients and you're still very much hands on with the projects that you do. Is that true? That's, it, absolutely. And that's why I never grew to be more than 18 people, honestly. You know, after that point, you do get divorced from your clients. You have to, in a way. And that didn't interest me. Of course, that's why I'm also never got bought out by a big company and I'm not a gazillionaire. So, but, you know, that said, it was, um, it was purposeful on my point because I do, I, I, I enjoy that. I mean, you know, clients often give you the solution. You know, it's just, you know, they, they you don't want them to tell you what that solution is, but if you listen carefully, the client always gives you the, the answer. They, they do. And they give it to you in the first meeting. You just have to be really listening hard because what you want to do when you present your idea to a client is really use their words, you know, because you said this, you know, and this is the way it manifested itself. Well, I'm so glad you said that because that actually segues perfectly into the first question in the comments and so maybe you could expand upon it um, the question is when presenting bold new ideas to clients have you ever met with resistance from a conservative audience how do you convince a stubborn client to go in a bold direction it was like we planned that that was amazing <laughs> really yeah great question um okay first off they should be familiar with your work just let, let's start with that you know so um but that said wells fargo you could have a more conservative client than that, really. And I take a number of different approaches. One, during that first meeting, I'm really listening to them. I'm also steering them, even Clorox, I steered them in that first meeting just to see how would they take to me saying, you're not gonna have anything but your, you know, cover with a, you know, just your, your bottle on it. Or, you know, Wells Fargo, how do you feel about, we're not gonna show, you know, this anymore. We're gonna be, you know, we're gonna have script and bank script and this and that and this whole integrated, look, and you are steering them in that first meeting to, to understand the way you are thinking and probably even the way the solutions could turn out. Another thing is that on occasion, it is important and very um, helpful to actually take a client through the process. Now, there's a downside to that. The downside to that is they might like something that you did that you didn't feel comfortable with. But remember, they're coming to you as a professional. You are a professional. You cut your degree in design. You know, you got your BFA. This, this is what's important. And by taking them through that, you're showing them that you've thought everything that they've thought about. You know, well, you know, how about this? Well, you know, here's this. You know, you I start them here. I started here. But I noticed this wasn't working. The type like, superposed over a photograph, there was too much contrast. You couldn't read the type. So then I tried knocking out the type here. Oh, and then I realized if I put it in a box here and da 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 and da da da. And so then they are going with you on this journey. Take your client on the journey with you. Sometimes that really, really helps. Mm, that's really great advice. So we have another question in the chat that I'm going to read to you. And again, it's sort of in the professional realm. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the obstacles you have overcome in order to appropriately value and price your work? Have you always worked as a freelance private contractor and, or did you get representation? We talked about that a little bit, but how do you make sure that you are getting the, the pay that you deserve for the work that you're doing? Or how would you recommend that other people approach that as they begin as designers? Um, well, first of all, there's a great organization, AIGA, so there's a lot of guidelines there just in terms of, you know, basic, basic. Uh, one, you don't want to be an independent contractor. You know, <laughs> remember, you don't want to, you, you know, you're, you're a professional. I only, I never charge time and materials ever. It's always by project. Um, and uh, how do I price? I price high is what I price. You know what? And there's, you'd be surprised if you price too low, and this sounds counterintuitive, but it 
in some way sort of devalues your work for the amount of work that you're going to put into something. I mean, you know, I, I say the older you get, the easier it is to get ideas. And it is, you, you just, you know, I have, you know, whatever it is, you know, 65, I have all this, you know, experience behind me. It's easy. It's, it's easier to get ideas now. But um, ideas are worth money. You know, and now I can, you know, as I said, usually in the first meeting, I sort of know what the design is going to be. Would I let a client know that? No. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's value beyond time. <laughs> there's value for ideas. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and sometimes I, I'm very, you know, honest with them. Like I said, I think it's going to be, you know, in this range and just, or what is your budget? often you know what is your budget you know ask them that you know it's like one will tell you whether you know you say i just want to be fair and transparent with this you know and, and transparency is everything um so i hope that helps that does help thank you um any other questions that you guys want to ask in the chat again i'd be happy to read them out or if you want to unmute you're more than welcome to ask them out loud and maybe Everyone. Oh, go ahead, Fish, please. Hi, Jennifer, my name's Fish. I'm an assistant professor here. I have a question, it's a very basic one. It's what's a story? Um, if I describe your talk, my answer would be very similar. Easy to follow, holds my attention, memorable. What's your definition of what a story is? Mm, simple. <laughs> you know, it's a, just, just uh, it's a narrative. I mean, you're taking people, you're taking people on a journey. You're taking people on a journey. And that's a wonderful thing to do, whether it's the client, whether it's the audience, you know, you're, you're taking them down a path so that they understand ultimately what the client is trying to say. You're just, you're just putting it in a way that's accessible and design should be accessible, even though it might not appear to be that way. Oh, wow. This looks very conceptual, but everything I do is, is, is accessible in the way of it being um, that it resonates with the audience in some way. So um, I hope that answered your question. Great. Thank you for asking that fish. I really appreciate you jumping in. Um, we have a question for Megan and I think it's a really great one. So can we assume that you landed the New York Times Magazine cover? I did, yes, that was the real deal. And it was, oh my gosh. And then I heard the people, Tibor was one of them when he was alive, Tibor was one of them and Stefan Sagmeister and um, I can't remember who else. It was just intimidating, you know, and I knew both of them. It was like, oh, um, and I didn't think the times would go for it. Like, okay, let's take, you know, let's put, put it upside down. That is like a sacrosanct sort of thing, but they, they did. And they, you know, um, I have to really credit, you know, the, the, um, the art director of the of the magazine i'm sure she pushed pushed that through so but yes it did it, it did it did win <laughs> oh that's fantastic so i want to be mindful of the time we have about five minutes left so i have one last question for you and that's what's coming up next what are you excited about working on in in the next few years um well, I, you know, I don't know what's going to be coming up in the next few years. I have to say whatever project I'm working on at the time is my favorite project. Hmm. Always, you know, and uh, here's another little bit of advice. Um, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So when you're looking for clients, one of the things is that you don't want a client that already has a great look with them, even though they're great was like Apple. Oh, what could I, you know, like, oh, you know. Why not, you know, you want the, the, the guy that has the ugliest thing out there that you can make into something fantastic. You know, so I, I, I can ne nearly never say no to a job because I see the opportunity to make it great. You know, I just have to see whether they want to go along with the ride, you know, with me, you know. And another bit of advice is whenever possible, deal with the CEO or the president or a founder, um, especially a founder, I'm going to say. Uh, if somebody is starting a company, work with them because a founder will take risks. They don't know the word no. All they know is the word yes, because they've said yes. And that's what got them to start this company. Um, you know, if you're dealing with middle management, middle management, unfortunately, uh, it uh, exists to say no because they're scared to say yes. You know, yes means a commitment. <laughs> no is a great stall factor. So, um, and I'm, you know, at this, and, and I've worked, always, you know, sort of with, 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 with that. A little bit, just a very quick thing about my background. When I graduated from Mass Art, 
I moved to San Francisco because actually at the time, New York and Boston were very singular in the type of designer you were. You were either a publication designer, environmental designer, you were a annual report designer, you know, very specific and not integrated. The West Coast, San Francisco in particular, had that integration of more sort of a holistic view um, and a great design community. Not that there wasn't a great design, there were great design communities in Boston and New York, fantastic, but more, uh, more segmented. Um, my first job was in television. I worked for PBS. And why that was so good is that it was the very, television was the first one to have computer graphics and because they had big server rooms that were cold. And uh, I learned to actually tell a story through the movement of type and sound, live action and animation. Like those 30 second openings, which you really have now, gave me the opportunity to create the brand and then express whatever that is in a 30 second opening. I was so lucky that that was my first exposure because I really was sort of tuned in. And as a matter of fact, it was the early uh, days of computer. It was called a Quantel, uh, uh, the Quantel paint box system, which was the early, the Apple took basically, they bought out that uh, system with the drop down menu. After that, um, got paid nothing there, very little money, great exposure, uh, not a uh, uh, great learning. Uh, next job, uh, also no budgets. Next job, I get hired as our director of Levi Strauss. Still no money. I think I was making $17,000, even back in 19, whatever that was, 82, that was nothing. Um, and, uh, but I had real budgets to work with. And that's where I was able to, I was within a marketing department. It was just myself. I was the art director. So I did, I had a drawing table and I did all the work myself or I collaborated with photographers, et cetera. Oftentimes it takes a village to make anything. And then, um, but I got to know all the presidents there of the divisions. So if you work in house, it's really, a, it's a fantastic thing to work in house and it's a fantastic thing to work independently, have your own studio. I find it best to sort of work in house, get to know what, who those people are. Levi's was my client for 20 years. It was invaluable for me to start in my office. Oh, it's so great to hear the pathway. And actually you addressed one of the other questions. I know I had mentioned that I was curious about being a native Californian, the idea of different areas of the US and how the design culture can be different in different places. Um, so maybe- I, I think less, less and less now though, less mm -hmm. and less now. Yeah, uh, do, you, it, do you think that's a problem? I, I do you feel like it's becoming more homogenized? Oh, I, 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 homogenized sounds like a bad thing. So I wouldn't say it that way. I think that, th that um, because of, well, be, you know, because of, of, of the way we communicate now, um, that it's in every place in the country, every place in the world, really, you know, there is much more of a, of a, um, of a cohesion of, 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 of great design thinking in totality, I think. It's not, you know, a specific area of the country anymore. Mm -hmm. Even well, stylistically. Means, yes. For sure. And also means that we can have you come and speak to us from California, which is phenomenal. And thank you for being here so early in the morning where you are as well. Oh, yeah. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful. Hope you guys are staying warm. My sister I was saying my sister lives in Framingham. And I remember uh, the snowstorm of 78 where we I actually cross country skied on top of cars. And the only way you could tell you're on top of a car was seeing that little inch of an antenna stick out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's excellent. Well, I, I'm sure you're not missing us this winter, and I'm a little jealous no. of where you are. But Jennifer, thank you again so much. That was so inspiring, and it was so wonderful to see. And we're so proud to have you in our alumni list. It's amazing. Oh, I'm so happy. It was an honor. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm watching, I'm watching the participants tick down. I just heard that this is called Zoom chicken to see who leaves last. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait until That's we're finished. Jennifer, thank you again though. That was really exceptional. And I, we, it was just so lovely to interact with you and you've been so responsive and kind and generous in all of our interactions. So thank you for that. I, I, and I believe I'm teaching a class shortly. So, you know, in a couple of weeks, so. Yes, I class. know you're going to come into our, our type three class and I'm super excited about that. The students are too. It'll be great. Okay, great. Okay, take care, Catherine. Tomorrow, Jennifer. Take care. Okay, thank you, Darlene. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a great day.